This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. THE NAPOLEON OF NOTTING HILL by G. K. Chesterton Section 9, Book 3, Chapter 3 The Experiment of Mr. Buck An earnest and eloquent petition was sent up to the King, signed with the names of Wilson, Barker, Buck, Swindon, and others. It urged that at the forthcoming conference to be held in His Majesty's presence, touching the final disposition of the property in Pump Street, it might be held not inconsistent with political decorum and with the unutterable respect they entertained for His Majesty if they appeared in ordinary morning dress, without the costume decreed for them as provost. So it happened that the company appeared at that council in frock coats, and that the king himself limited his love of ceremony to appearing, after his not unusual manner, in evening dress with one order in this case not the garter but the button of the club of old clipper's best pals a decoration obtained with difficulty from a halfpenny boy's paper thus also it happened that the only spot of colour in the room was adam wayne who entered in great dignity with the great red robes and the great red sword we have met said auberon to decide the most arduous of modern problems may we be successful and he sat down gravely buck turned his chair a little and flung one leg over the other your majesty he said quite good-humouredly there is only one thing i can't understand and that is why this affair is not settled in five minutes here is a small property which is worth a thousand to us and is not worth a hundred to any one else we offer the thousand it's not business-like i know for we ought to get for less and it's not reasonable and it's not fair on us but i'm damned if i can see why it's difficult the difficulty may be very simply stated said wayne you may offer a million and it will be very difficult for you to get pump street but look here mr wayne cried barker striking in with a kind of cold excitement just look here you've no right to take up a position like that you've a right to stand out for a bigger price but you aren't doing that you're refusing what you and every sane man knows to be a splendid offer simply from malice or spite it must be malice or spite and that kind of thing is really criminal it's against the public good the king's government would be justified in forcing you with his lean fingers spread on the table he stared anxiously at wayne's face which did not move in forcing you it would he repeated it shall said buck shortly turning to the table with a jerk we have done our best to be decent wayne lifted his large eyes slowly was it my lord buck he inquired who said that the king of england shall do something buck flushed and said testily i mean it must it ought to as i say we have done our best to be generous i defy anyone to deny it as it is mr wayne i don't want to say a word that's uncivil I hope it's not uncivil to say that you can be and ought to be in goal. It is criminal to stop public works for a whim. A man might as well burn ten thousand onions in his front garden, or bring up his children to run naked in the street, as do what you say you have a right to do. People have been compelled to sell before. The king could compel you, and I hope he will. Until he does, said Wayne calmly. The power and government of this great nation is on my side, and not yours, and I defy you to defy it. In what sense, cried Barker, with his feverish eyes and hands, is the government on your side? With one ringing movement, Wayne unrolled the great parchment on the table. It was decorated down the sides with wild watercolor sketches of vestrymen and crowns and wreaths. The charter of the cities, he began buck exploded in a brutal oath and laughed that tomfool joke haven't we had enough and there you sit cried wayne springing erect with a voice like a trumpet with no argument but to insult the king before his face buck rose also with blazing eyes 
I am hard to bully, he began, and the slow tones of the king struck in with incomparable gravity. My lord Buck, I must ask you to remember that your king is present. It is not often that he needs to protect himself among his subjects. Barker turned to him with frantic gestures. Oh, for God's sake, don't back up the madman now, he implored. Have your joke another time. Oh, for heaven's sake! My Lord Provost of South Kensington, said King Auburn steadily, I do not follow your remarks, which are uttered with a rapidity unusual at court, nor do your well-meant efforts to convey the rest with your fingers materially assist me. I say that my Lord Provost of North Kensington, to whom I spoke, ought not, in the presence of his sovereign, to speak disrespectfully of his sovereign's ordinances. Do you disagree? Barker turned restlessly in his chair, and Buck cursed without speaking. The king went on in a comfortable voice. My lord provost of Notting Hill, proceed. Wayne turned his blue eyes on the king, and to every one's surprise there was a look in them not of triumph, but of a certain childish distress. I am sorry, your majesty, he said. I fear I was more than equally to blame with the lord provost of North Kensington. We were debating somewhat eagerly, and we both rose to our feet. I did so first, I am ashamed to say. The provost of North Kensington is therefore comparatively innocent. I beseech your majesty to address your rebuke chiefly, at least to me. Mr. Buck is not innocent, for he did no doubt, in the heat of the moment, speak disrespectfully. But the rest of the discussion he seems to me to have conducted with great good temper. Buck looked genuinely pleased, for businessmen are all simple-minded, and have therefore that degree of communion with fanatics. The king, for some reason, looked for the first time in his life ashamed. This very kind speech of the provost of Notting Hill, began Buck pleasantly, seems to me to show that we have at least got to a friendly footing. Now come, Mr. Wayne, five hundred pounds have been offered to you for a property you admit not to be worth a hundred. Well, I am a rich man, and I won't be outdone in generosity. Let us say fifteen hundred pounds, and have done with it, and let us shake hands. And he rose, glowing and laughing. Fifteen hundred pounds, whispered Mr. Wilson of Bayswater. Can we do fifteen hundred pounds? I'll stand the racket, said Bug heartily. Mr. Wayne is a gentleman, and has spoken up for me, so I suppose the negotiations are at an end. Wayne bowed. They are indeed at an end. I am sorry. I cannot sell you the property. What? cried Mr. Barker, starting to his feet. Mr. Buck has spoken correctly, said the king. I have, I have, cried Buck, springing up. Also, I said, Mr. Buck has spoken correctly, said the king. The negotiations are at an end. All the men at the table rose to their feet. Wayne alone rose without excitement. Have I then, he said, your majesty's permission to depart? I have given my last answer. You have it, said Auberon, smiling, and not lifting his eyes from the table, and amid a dead silence the provost of Notting Hill passed out of the room. Well, said Wilson, turning round to Barker, well. Barker shook his head desperately. The man ought to be in an asylum, he said, but one thing is clear, we need not bother further about him. The man can be treated as mad. Of course, said Buck, turning to him with somber decisiveness. You're perfectly right, Barker. He is a good enough fellow, but he can be treated as mad. Let's put it in simple form. Go and tell any twelve men in any town. Go and tell any doctor in any town that there is a man offered fifteen hundred pounds for a thing he could sell commonly for four hundred, and that when asked for a reason for not accepting it, he pleads the inviolate sanctity of Notting Hill and calls it the holy mountain. What would they say? What more can we have on our side than the common sense of everybody? On what else do all laws rest? I'll tell you, Barker, what's better than any further discussion? Let's send in workmen on the spot to pull down Pump Street, and if old Wayne says a word, arrest him as a lunatic. That's all. Barker's eyes kindled. I always regarded you, Buck, if you don't mind my saying so, as a very strong man. I'll follow you. So, of course, will I, said Wilson. Buck rose again impulsively. 
"'Your Majesty,' he said, glowing with popularity, "'I beseech Your Majesty to consider favourably "'the proposal to which we have committed ourselves. "'Your Majesty's leniency, our own offers, "'have fallen in vain on that extraordinary man. "'He may be right, he may be God, he may be the devil, "'but we think it for practical purposes more probable "'that he is off his head. "'Unless that assumption were acted on, "'all human affairs would go to pieces.' We act on it, and we propose to start operations at Notting Hill at once. The king leaned back in his chair. The charter of the cities, he said with a rich intonation. But Buck, being finally serious, was also cautious, and did not again make the mistake of disrespect. Your Majesty, he said, bowing, I am not here to say a word against anything Your Majesty has said or done. You are a far better educated man than I, and no doubt there were reasons upon intellectual grounds for those proceedings. But may I ask you an appeal to your common good nature for a sincere answer? When you drew up the charter of the cities, did you contemplate the rise of a man like Adam Wayne? Did you expect that the charter, whether it was an experiment or a scheme of decoration or a joke, could ever really come to this, to stopping a vast scheme of ordinary business, to shut up a road, to spoiling the chances of cabs, omnibuses, railway stations, to disorganizing half a city, to risking a kind of civil war, whatever were your objects, were they that? Barker and Wilson looked at him admiringly, the king more admiringly still. Provo Buck, said Auburn, you speak in public uncommonly well. I give you your point, with the magnanimity of an artist. My scheme did not include the appearance of Mr. Wayne. Alas, would that my poetic power had been great enough. I thank your majesty, said Buck courteously and quickly. Your majesty's statements are always clear and studied. Therefore I may draw a deduction. As the scheme, whatever it was on which you set your heart, did not include the appearance of Mr. Wayne, it will survive his removal. Why not let us clear away this particular pump street, which does interfere with our plans, and which does not, by your majesty's own statement, interfere with yours. Caught out, said the king, enthusiastically and quite impersonally, as if he were watching a cricket match. This man Wayne, continued Buck, would be shut up by any doctors in England, but we only ask to have it put before them. Meanwhile, no one's interests, not even in all probability his own, can really be damaged by going on with the improvements in Notting Hill. Not our interests, of course, for it has been the hard and quiet work of ten years. Not the interests of Notting Hill, for nearly all its educated inhabitants desire the change. Not the interests of Your Majesty, for you say, with characteristic sense, that you never contemplated the rise of a lunatic at all. Not, as I say, his own interests, for the man has a kind heart and many talents, and a couple of good doctors would probably put him righter than all the free cities and sacred mountains in creation. I therefore assume, if I may use so bold a word, that Your Majesty will not offer any obstacle to our proceeding with the improvements. And Mr. Buck sat down amid subdued, but excited applause among his allies. Mr. Buck, said the king, I beg your pardon for a number of beautiful and sacred thoughts in which you were generally classified as a fool. But there is another thing to be considered. Suppose you send in your workmen, and Mr. Wayne does a thing regrettable indeed, but of which I am sorry to say I think him quite capable, knocks their teeth out. I have thought of that, Your Majesty, said Mr. Buck easily. I think it can simply be guarded against. Let us send in a strong guard of, say, a hundred men. A hundred of the North Kensington halberdiers, he smiled grimly, of whom Your Majesty is so fond, or say a hundred and fifty. The whole population of Pump Street, I fancy, is only about a hundred. Still, they might stand together and lick you, said the king dubiously. Then say two hundred, said Buck gaily. It might happen, said the king restlessly, that one Notting Hiller fought better than two North Kensingtons. It might, said Buck coolly. Then say two hundred and fifty. The king bit his lip. And if they are beaten too, he said viciously. Your Majesty, said Buck, and leaned back easily in his chair, suppose they are. If anything be clear, it is clear that all fighting matters are mere matters of arithmetic. Here we have a hundred and fifty, say, of Notting Hill soldiers, or say two hundred. 
if one of them can fight two of us we can send in not four hundred but six hundred and smash them that is all it is out of all immediate probability that one of them could fight four of us so what i say is this run no risks finish it at once send in eight hundred men and smash him smash him almost without seeing him and go on with the improvements and mr buck pulled out a bandana and blew his nose do you know mr buck said the king staring gloomily at the table the admirable clearness of your reason produces in my mind a sentiment which i trust shall not offend you by describing it as an aspiration to punch your head you irritate me sublimely what can it be in me is it the relic of a moral sense but your majesty said barker eagerly and suavely does not refuse our proposals my dear barker your proposals are as damnable as your manners i want to have nothing to do with them suppose i stopped them altogether what would happen barker answered in a very low voice revolution the king glanced quickly at the men round the table they were all looking down silently their brows were red he rose with a startling suddenness and an unusual pallor gentlemen he said you have overruled me therefore i can speak plainly i think adam wayne who is as mad as a hatter worth more than a million of you but you have the force and i admit the common sense and he is lost take your eight hundred halberdiers and smash him it would be more sportsmanlike to take two hundred more sportsmanlike said buck grimly but a great deal less humane we are not artists and streets purple with gore do not catch our eye in the right way it is pitiable said auburn with five or six times their number there will be no fight at all i hope not said buck rising and adjusting his gloves we desire no fight your majesty we are peaceable business men well said the king wearily the conference is at an end at last and he went out of the room before anyone else could stir forty workmen a hundred bayswater halberdiers two hundred from south and three from north kensington assembled at the foot of holland walk and marched up it under the general direction of barker who looked flushed and happy and full dress at the end of the procession a small and sulky figure lingered like an urchin it was the king barker he said at length appealingly you are an old friend of mine you understand my hobbies as i understand yours why can't you let it alone i hope that such fun might come out of this wayne business why can't you let it alone it doesn't really so much matter to you what's a road or so for me it's the one joke that may save me from pessimism take fewer men and give me an hour's fun really and truly james if you collected coins of hummingbirds and i could buy one with the price of your road i would buy it i collect incidents those rare those precious things let me have one pay a few pounds for it give these nodding hillers a chance let them alone auberon said barker kindly forgetting all royal titles in a rare moment of sincerity i do feel what you mean i have had moments when these hobbies have hit me i have had moments when i have sympathized with your humours i have had moments though you may not easily believe it when i have sympathized with the madness of adam wayne but the world auburn the real world is not run on these hobbies it goes on great brutal wheels of facts wheels on which you are the butterfly and wayne is the fly on the wheel auburn's eyes looked frankly at the others thank you james what you say is true it is only a parenthetical consolation to me to compare the intelligence of flies somewhat favorably with the intelligence of wheels but it is in the nature of flies to die soon and the nature of wheels to go on forever go on with the wheel good-bye old man and james barker went on laughing with a high color slapping his bamboo on his leg the king watched the tail of the retreating regiment with a look of genuine depression which made him seem more like a baby than ever then he swung round and struck his hands together in a world without humor he said the only thing to do is eat and how perfect an exception how can these people strike dignified attitudes and pretend that things matter 
when the total ludicrousness of life is proved by the very method by which it is supported. A man strikes the lyre and says, Life is real, life is earnest, and then goes into a room and stuffs alien substances into a hole in his head. I think nature was indeed a little broad in her humour in these matters, but we all fall back on the pantomime, as I have in this municipal affair. Nature has her farces, like the act of eating or the shape of the kangaroo, for the more brutal appetite. She keeps her stars and mountains for those who can appreciate something more subtly ridiculous. He turned to his equerry, but as I said, eating, let us have a picnic like two nice little children. Just run and bring me a table and a dozen courses or so, and plenty of champagne, and under these swinging boughs, Bowler, we will return to nature. It took about an hour to erect in Holland Lane the monarch's simple repast, during which time he walked up and down and whistled, but still with an unaffected air of gloom. He had really been done out of a pleasure he had promised himself, and had that empty and sickened feeling which a child has when disappointed of a pantomime. When he and the equerry had sat down, however, and consumed a fair amount of dry champagne, his spirits began mildly to revive. "'Things take too long in this world,' he said. "'I detest all this Barkerarian business about evolution and the gradual modification of things. I wish the world had been made in six days and knocked to pieces again in six more, and I wish I had done it. The joke's good enough in a broad way, sun and moon and the image of God and all that, but they keep it up so damnably long. Did you ever long for a miracle, Bowler? No, sir, said Bowler, who was an evolutionist, and had been carefully brought up. Then I have, answered the king. I have walked along a street with the best cigar in the cosmos in my mouth, and more burgundy inside me than you ever saw in your life, and longed that the lamp-post would turn into an elephant to save me from the hell of blank existence. Take my word for it, my evolutionary bowler. Don't you believe people when they tell you that people sought for a sign and believed in miracles because they were ignorant? They did it because they were wise, filthily, vilely wise, too wise to eat or sleep or put on their boots with patience. This seems delightfully like a new theory of the origin of Christianity, which would itself be a thing of no mean absurdity. Take some more wine. The wind blew round them as they sat at their little table with its white cloth and bright wine cups and flung the treetops of Holland Park against each other. But the sun was in that strong temper which turns green into gold. The king pushed away his plate, lit a cigar slowly, and went on. Yesterday I thought that something next door to a really entertaining miracle might happen to me before I went to amuse the worms to see that red-haired maniac waving a great sword and making speeches to his incomparable followers would have been a glimpse of that land of youth from which the fate shut us out. I had planned some quite delightful things, a congress of Knightsbridge with a treaty and myself in the chair, and perhaps a Roman triumph with jolly old Barker led in chains. And now these wretched prigs have gone and stamped out the exquisite Mr. Wayne altogether, and I suppose they will put him in a private asylum somewhere in their damned humane way. I think of the treasures daily poured out to his unappreciative keeper. I wonder whether they would let me be his keeper. But life is a veil. Never forget at any moment of your existence to regard it in the light of a veil. This graceful habit, if not acquired in youth, the king stopped with his cigar lifted, for there had slid into his eyes the startled look of a man listening. He did not move for a few moments, then turned his head sharply towards the high, thin, and lath-like paling which fenced certain long gardens and similar spaces from the lane. From behind it there was coming a curious scrambling and scraping noise, as of a desperate thing imprisoned in this box of thin wood. The king threw away his cigar and jumped on to the table. From this position he saw a pair of hands hanging with a hungry clutch at the top of the fence. Then the hands quivered with a convulsive effort, and a head shot up between them. The head of one of the Bayswater's town council. His eyes and whiskers wild with fear. He swung himself over and fell on the other side on his face, and groaned openly and without ceasing. The next moment the thin, 
taut wood of the fence was struck as by a bullet, so that it reverberated like a drum, and over it came tearing and cursing with torn clothes and broken nails and bleeding faces, twenty men at one rush. The king sprang five feet clear off the table to the ground. The moment after the table was flung over, sending bottles and glasses flying, and the debris was literally swept along the ground by that stream of men pouring past, and Bowler was borne along with them, as the king said in his famous newspaper article, like a captured bride. The great fence swung and split under the load of climbers that still scaled and cleared it. Tremendous gaps were torn in it by this living artillery, and through them the king could see more and more frantic faces as in a dream, and more and more men running. They were as miscellaneous as if someone had taken the lid off a human dustbin. Some were untouched, some were slashed and battered and bloody, some were splendidly dressed, some tattered and half-naked, some were in the fantastic garb of the burlesque cities, some in the dullest modern dress. The king stared at all of them, but none of them looked at the king. Suddenly he stepped forward. Barker, he said, what is all this? Beaten, said the politician, beaten all to hell, and he plunged past with nostrils shaking like a horse's, and more and more men plunged after him. Almost as he spoke, the last standing strip of fence bowed and snapped, flinging as from a catapult a new figure upon the road. He wore the flaming red of the halberdiers of Notting Hill, and on his weapon there was blood and in his face victory. In another moment masses of red glowed through the gaps of fence, and the pursuers with their halberds came pouring down the lane, pursued and pursuers alike, swept by the little figure with the owlish eyes who had not taken his hands out of his pockets. The king had still little beyond the confused sense of a man caught in a torrent, the feeling of men eddying by. Then something happened which he was never able afterwards to describe, and which we cannot describe for him. Suddenly in the dark entrance, between the broken gates of a garden, there appeared framed a flaming figure. Adam Wayne, the conqueror, with his face flung back and his mane like a lion's, stood with his great sword point upwards, the red raiment of his office flapping round him like the red wings of an archangel, and the king saw he knew not how, something new and overwhelming. The great green trees, the great red robes, swung together in the wind. The sword seemed made for the sunlight. The preposterous masquerade, born of his own mockery, towered over him and embraced the world. This was the normal. This was sanity. This was nature. And he himself, with his rationality and his detachment and his black frock coat, he was the exception and the accident, a blot of black upon a world of crimson and gold. End of Book 3, Chapter 3